Welcome to the 5G Guys Podcast, the premier resource for industry insiders and newcomers alike to explore anything and everything wireless telecommunication. We discuss, explain, and explore all things wireless technology. So let's dive right in. Welcome your host, Dan McVaugh and Wayne Smith. Welcome back for another episode of the 5G Guys. I'm Wayne Smith. And I'm joined by my co-host, Dan McVall. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks again for listening. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. Rate us. Go to 5gguys.com to catch up with us and learn more about what we've got going on. Excited today to have Marty Cooper as our guest. Marty is an engineer, inventor, entrepreneur, and futurist. He's known as the father of the cell phone because he led the creation of the world's first portable cell phone at Motorola and made the first public call on it over nearly three decades Of working at Motorola, he contributed to the development of pagers, two-way radio dispatch systems, and much more. Today, he's a serial entrepreneur with his wife, Arlene Arlene, Arlene Harris, and they've co-founded numerous wireless technology companies, including cellular business systems, SOS Wireless Communications, Great Call, and Arraycom. Marty's currently the chairman of Dyna LLC, a member of the FCC's Technical Advisory Council. In 2013, Marty became a member of the National Academy of Engineering, from whom he received the Charles Stark Draper Prize for Engineering. He's also been awarded the Marconi Prize for being a wireless visionary who reshaped the concept of mobile communications. He's been inducted into the Consumer Electronics Hall of Fame and Wireless History Foundation's Wireless Hall of Fame. He is also a lifetime member of IEEE and was president of its Vehicular Technology Society and received its Centennial Medal. In 2007, Time Magazine named him one of the 100 best inventors in history. So that's a tough act to follow, Marty. So we're, we're, we're glad to have you. Thanks for joining. It's it's honor to have you on the show. Before we get started, I also want to let everybody know that you just came out with a book this year called Cutting the Cord. It's a great read. Check it out if you guys haven't checked it out. It gives us a good background on the history of cellular from Marty's perspective, but also kind of lets us know where he thinks the, the industry is going and the technology is going in the future. So... Check that book out if you haven't, haven't had a chance. So thanks for being here, Marty. My great pleasure, and, and, and Wayne. Hey, Marty. I know you always get asked this. What led up to the invention of the portable phone at Motorola, and what significance has it had on as a result? Well, that's about a two-hour question, but I'll try to <laughs> encapsulate that in a minute or two. Uh, what led up to it was a couple of things. Number one is the awareness of the freedom that people got when they could communicate wherever they were instead of being hooked to the wall or to their desk by that wire that they, for a hundred years, the carriers had told us that it was the only way for us to communicate. And I was in the two-way radio business and we had figured out by then how to do two-way radios with a battery operated equipment. And, and we watched how businesses became much more efficient, that people communicated better. So we knew that that was the right way to go. And then the Bell system, you guys are too young to remember the Bell system, but the Bell system came along and said, we got this new thing called cellular that we are going to implement and it's going to revolutionize communications. And what we're going to do is put communications in every automobile. And somehow they didn't get it. What we were trying to do was change communications from one place to another, which is what wired communications did, to a person, to another person, which is what cellular communications does. And here that they're saying is that we define this the other end of a conversation as automobile. We knew that was wrong. And Motorola, which was, relatively speaking, a small company, Bell System was the biggest company in the world. And we took them on. We battled with the ENT for 14 years between 1969 and 1983 when cellular became commercial. And thank goodness for society, we ended up winning. Cellular ended up being, first of all, competitive, which is probably the most important thing we accomplished. And the other thing is that the we decided to make cellular personal communications right from the beginning. Do you, do you think, Marty, that divestiture in 82 with the breakup of, of the Bell system, do you think it would have happened regardless of the work you guys did with Motorola and, and, and your, your work? Or was it inevitable and, and, and just happened sooner? Kind of what's your, your take on how you guys played a role in that, in that divestiture? Well, there is no question it was inevitable. It would have happened no matter what. 
But think about it. If you design a system, you know, Wayne will be especially sensitive to this. If you design a system that is specifically aimed at, at covering cars, you need many fewer cell sites. You use a much higher power in the car, and that system would not accommodate portables at all. So it would have required at some time in the future completely rebuild the system, and that would have taken a long time. So my, my guess, and I, of course, uh, there's no way to prove this, but my guess is that we brought personal communications to society at least 10 years sooner than it would have happened otherwise. Yeah. Well, and, and to your point earlier, you, you, you talked about, you know, how long it takes to build a network. Remind, remind our listeners that day that you made the first portable phone call on that prototype phone that you guys designed at Motorola was, was what year? Oh, 1973, April 3rd, 1973. Right. And the first commercial cellular phone call was placed in Chicago 10 years later. So it took 10 years from the time you made that first prototype call until the first actual commercial network was up and running, right? That's exactly right. There were a number of things that caused that delay. The, the biggest single thing was that building two portable units to demonstrate was an extraordinary achievement, but turning those two prototypes into something that could be reproduced, that could be manufactured at a price that people could afford, took many years. The, the first portable was hundreds of individual parts, things like coils. People, young engineers don't even know what a coil is today so uh, because everything is, is not an integrated circuit chip. So, so that was one factor. But the more difficult one was the FCC had to decide who the carriers were going to be. If it was going to be competitive, you had to have more than one person. And so the tele telephone companies became one side of the of the carriers, but they had to come up with a system and find who else would do it. And that took a couple of years. So it was a painful process, but somehow it all worked out. It must have because most of the people in the world today have cell phones, and there are more cell phones in the world today than there are people. Yeah, that's crazy. It's It's crazy to think. And then you know, as we start adding, you know, Internet of Things and all of the devices that are also using that network, it's, you know, billions and billions of things that are using these networks. It's just phenomenal to think about. Yeah. So so do you think this is as it relates to that divestiture and the breakup? So when that happened and cellular started, to your point, we had we had two competitors, which still was not ideal, right? It's still a duopoly. And I remember when I started in the industry, it, that wasn't ideal either from a competitive standpoint. And we've, we've fast forwarded to the mid nineties where, you know, with spectrum auctions and the thing and things of that nature, we had upwards of six, seven competitors in a network. Do you think we're starting to head back a little bit more towards, towards the right levels of co competition today or with the consolidation, do you feel like it's starting to become less competitive? What's kind of your take on where we're at today as it relates to competition in the cellular industry? Well, you hit all my hot buttons. <laughs> Dan, as usual. Yes, I do believe that we have regressed in that regard. I have a view that every person is different from every other person, and that a service that satisfies one kind of person doesn't necessarily satisfy another, satisfy another per, a person. And in a really competitive world, entrepreneurs will come along and they'll see an opportunity to serve uniquely some group of people or some service, and they will do that. I feel very sad about the fact that, that we're down to three carriers. I'm a very strong advocate of competition. I think that's what makes our whole system work. That's why the United States is, is still the most productive and most advanced country in the world. And it's because we have a system where people compete. And somehow we have somehow lost that skill in the cellular industry for two reasons. One is what you pointed out, Dan, that we're down to three carriers in most places. But the other one is that the at least two of the carriers are acting like they're the old bell system. They're telling us what we need instead of doing what real capitalistic systems do is is you do market research and you find out what the needs of people are and you respond to the needs of people. Hey, real quick, a quick word of thanks to today's sponsor, Vertex Innovations. For over 17 years, Vertex has been building the nation's wireless and broadband networks, providing project management, network engineering, 
and construction oversight are just some of the ways Vertex helps their clients. So if you're looking for more of a partner to help you with your wireless network designs, construction, implementation, or operations, reach out to Vertex. You can find them at vertex-us.com. That's V-E-R-T-E-X-U-S.com. You know, you started and made one of the first phone calls in wireless. Where do you see the next five years in wireless taking us? Is it all this 5G hype or is it something else? And do you look that far ahead, you know, into where you think technology is going? That would be a great one if you could give us a little insight on that. Well, Wayne, uh, thank you for that question. I I think you're both familiar with the law of spectral capacity that some people call Cooper's law. But the one thing that is going to keep happening is that the capacity of spectrum will keep increasing and the cost is going to keep going down. We have enough competition so that the carriers do have a little bit of pressure and sooner or later that is going to continue to happen. But that's not unimportant. That's, that's the science. The important thing is we are starting to appreciate the importance of, of wireless communications in education, but also more so in healthcare. And the biggest one is in collaboration. The, what you guys are doing with your podcast of, of spreading ideas, getting people to think, getting people to learn is so important, and it is making society more efficient. And that's what edu- us engineers do. We make things more efficient. We raise the standard of living in every respect, and wireless is a major contributor to that. The, the fact is the United Nations did a study and they said that a billion people have moved out of severe poverty over the last 20 years, largely because of the available of cell phones. Now we're in this country, we don't even think about things like that because I don't think there are very many people in what they call severe poverty in places like Africa and Mexico. And please, These are people that are starving. We, I don't think we have people that starve in, in, in this country. So that kind of a thing is happening. Our our standard of living worldwide is going up. I I don't think that anybody in the world ought to, in a future world, uh, be hungry. Everybody ought to be educated. We have enough productivity in the world today that we should be able to take care of everybody in the world and not just the wealthy people. So I know that's a very high-level answer to a, a, a very good question, and very specifically, we are, and the law of spectral capacity has predicted that, we're starting to use these new techniques. The most important one, I call it smart antennas. We engineers always come up with new names for everything so that we can impress people with how smart we are. But the, the most important technology within the cellular networks, I think, is the MIMO, and specifically multi-user MIMO. It's what multiple. It, 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 it's basically smart antennas, uh, but it, it improves the efficiency of communication. The other things that are happening that are five G things have to do with the Internet of Things. There are things that you were alluding to, Wayne, were, of, of having sub networks within the primary network. So the, the technological changes are going to keep happening. I just hope we don't lose sight of the basic requirements, which are coverage and cost. Humans, if you read my book, which I know both of you did, you wouldn't have invited <laughs> me if you, if you didn't. One of my fundamental principles is that technology is the application of science to make products and services that make people's lives better. If you take people out of that thing, it's not technology. It's curiosity, it's investigation, it's research, but it's not technology. And we do occasionally forget about the people. We get so enchanted with our gadgets and, and with the technology itself. And that's the worst thing an engineer can do is to get captivated by the science and forget about the fact that everything that we do has to be people-oriented, human-centered. So that's the end of that yeah. lecture. I thought it was great. It's eloquently put. I loved your take on engineering since Dan and I are both engineers. <laughs> so thank you for that. Dan, I'll hand it back to you. You know, yeah. Th- thanks, Marty. And just just for our listeners, we try to not fill you with too many acronyms. So MIMO stands for multiple in, multiple out. The way I try to describe it to people is it's like having not just two ears, but having fifty ears. And how well could you listen and hear things if you had fifty ears that could look all directions and 
And some of your ears would reject things you don't want to listen to and others would focus on ones you do. And the same thing on talking, if you had multiple mouths, same sort of thing. So would you, how, how do you feel about that analogy, Marty? Is that, is that a good way to put it to the layman? I think that was wonderful. I, I know you were a little reticent to talk about 50 mouths, but that, that is a very important part of it. Right, if, right. If you have 50 mouths that have spatial arrangements, and 50 years that are, you you would increase the capacity of our ability to talk to each other by millions of times. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah, you know, Marty, one of the things that you're known for, and I've read that your legacy is Cooper's Law. And, you know, in Cooper's Law, you know, the law of spectral efficiency, can you give us a little feedback on how that's rolling into where we're at today and 5G and what you see, how that plays out? In the use of spectrum? Sure. What well, the, the myth is that spectrum is like beachfront property. There are so many, only so many radio channels, and when those are all used up, you just don't have any more. And nothing could be more ridiculous. If you think about when Marconi first commercialized radio back at the beginning of, of 1900 or so, and there, there was the capacity of the radio spectrum. It was one person talk covering the whole world at a bit every six seconds. That's how, that's what was the total communication that went on in the whole world. Since then, we have improved the capacity of the spectrum. The amount of information that can be transferred wirelessly in the radio spectrum and by something like 10 trillion times. That's a really big number. And and what I observed, because uh, it's not really a law, is that we have on the average doubled the capacity of the spectrum. This thing that's so-called beachfront property, we have doubled the amount of property every two and a half years for 120 years. And when you look at it, most of this has happened by advances in technology. We know how to compress things. We know how to put more technology over a given number of square miles. And there are enough tools left so we can predict doing this for at least another 50 or 60 years. And by that time, we'll have invented new stuff. So the amount of spectrum available to us is, for all practical purposes, infinite. Unfortunately, and we don't have any techies in Congress. And so they, what they are doing is auctioning off pieces of the radio spectrum, radio channels, to individuals for their exclusive use, which in itself is a very inefficient thing to do. Thing to do. And they are allowing these carriers to, to latch on to more and more spectrum, keep other people from getting new segments of the spectrum. And as a result, we don't have a motivation to use the spectrum effectively and efficiently. Forgetting about all that, in my optimistic view, we are going to keep increasing the capacity of the spectrum. We are going to be doing more and more wirelessly because wirelessly is the only way to communicate with moving resources. And human beings are moving resources. So that is going to keep happening. And I'm hoping that this thing they call Cooper's Law, that I call the law of spectral capacity, is going to at least give us an objective of, of what we can do to serve society with wireless technology. Sorry about that long answer, Wayne, but that, that was the short version. I think it leads into Dan, some of Dan's other questions. So I'll let you jump in, Dan. On, I like what you have teed up for us. Well, I think that the biggest thing that I'd like to make sure we touch on is I'd like to give you the opportunity to just kind of tell us what you're up to today. Tell us where you think things are going. What, what, what sort of words of wisdom would you want to leave our listeners with as we wrap up today? Well, what I'm doing today is is I have the luxury of not having to work for a living. Unfortunately, my wife is working for a living, and I have to support her in that regard. But I'm philosophizing. I'm working very hard on trying to teach people about the importance of, of wireless technology in education, about the fact that we now have a digital divide. We have a class of people who are getting 
better education than they have ever gotten in their lives in history uh, because they have access to all the knowledge in the world. And the students know more than their teachers about facts. Teachers can teach students things that they can't learn from books or from the uh, internet. And there we have a class of students that are going to be much smarter than we are. Unfortunately, uh, almost half the students in the United States, one of the most advanced countries in the world, half of our students do not have access to the internet. Either, either it's because they don't have service or because they can't afford it. And that's unacceptable. I think that having internet for education is an essential thing, is as important as, as water and food, and we've got to fix that. So I write blogs, do a little bit of what you guys are doing. I, have, I haven't done anything quite as ambitious as what you do, but I am trying to spread the word about the kinds of things that we've been talking about, about the importance of wireless and about what the future of wireless is going to be. How would, how would our listeners act with you in the blogs that you're writing? Oh, the company that my wife and I use as our base is, is called Dyna LLC. Actually, you can find me just at martycooper.com. And, and the, that will lead you to my FAQ, my blogs, and my version of the history of wireless. Well, perfect. Well, thanks for joining us and sharing your wisdom, Marty. It's so cool to remember and how important, you know, how we got where we are and where we're going. And I think Dan and I, we definitely agree with you. Education is a really big part of it. That's why we put the 5G Guys podcast together is to get people excited, making sure that society is connected and moving things forward. Well, Wayne and Dan, I, you guys perform a really important public service, and I can't thank you enough for giving me this uh, opportunity to, to talk to your constituency. You bet. You bet, Marty. Thanks Thanks for joining us. And, and thanks, everyone, for listening. We really appreciate it. Like we said at the top of the show, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button to get more of what we're doing. And give us some, some stars if you like it. Tell your friends. Go to 5gguys.com to connect with us. Go to martycooper.com to connect with him. And definitely go check out that book, Cutting the Cord. It's a great read. And we love hearing back from you guys. So definitely comment. Tell us what you think. Tell us what we got wrong. We're not perfect. We want to hear from you and and get that feedback on future episodes. So thanks again for joining us. Take care and be well. Thanks for listening to the 5G Guys. For more resources and to connect with Dan and Wayne, check out their website at 5GGuys.com. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit that follow button and share this episode with your friends and family. 